This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Carl Sketchley, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for joining us as we continue to navigate our way through COVID-19 and its effects on business and education. With on-site networking events still on hold, these JSA virtual roundtables are especially relevant as a timely platform where we can seek advice and information from top industry thought leaders. For the next 45 minutes, we'll face the latest challenges of today's new reality together as one network infrastructure community. Also, as a little sunshine hopefully at your door today, we have provided lunch, or if you chose, a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So for those of you who received, please enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started. And a quick reminder, this is a roundtable. We want to hear from you and answer your questions. So please go ahead and type your questions into our JSA question box. We will work to get to as many as possible. And in the last 15 minutes of the hour, we will take our conversation over to LinkedIn for a chat with our speakers. Either search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables and our feed will come up or click on the direct link we will share in our chat box shortly. Once there, we will be reviewing the questions we don't get a chance to cover in the next 45 minutes. Feel free to post your own questions and thoughts to our panelists there as well. This is JSA's fifth roundtable in a series of necessary right now on COVID-19 and its impact on education networks. Our next one up is redefining communications in the wake of COVID-19. That roundtable is just three weeks away, June 18th, at 1 p.m. Eastern Time with feature guest moderator Rosemary Cochran, principal and co-founder of Vertical Systems Group. Check it out on jsa.net and register. So let's get started. Today's topic, COVID-19 and its impact on education networks. And to underscore the importance of today's chat, we have over 200 registrants joining us today. Thank you for your continued support of this series. And thank you to our panelists for dedicating their time for us today. To help us introduce them and to guest moderate, please welcome Rob Powell, founder and chief editor of Telecom Ramblings, an influential industry publication. Rob, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Carl, and thank you to JSA for the invitation to moderate today's panel. And hello, everybody out there. It's uh, been quite a couple of months, and I hope everybody is doing well uh, out there as things start to tentatively reopen. You know, usually when we say that you know some global event has affected everyone, there's kind of a little metaphor and exaggeration involved, and not this time, I guess. It's uh, true at just about every level, uh, but one of the most visible early on was in the uh, the worlds of education when all the students came home, uh, whether from kindergarten all the way up through college and all the parents started helping them connect and do distance learning on mass. Uh, the demands placed on network infrastructure, infrastructure for educational institutions and those in the industry that support them has been it shifted overnight. Uh, today to talk about exactly, you know, what we've been seeing out there and, and what, you know, to think and talk about how it's gone. Our uh, five panelists with us, um, panel of experts from across the network world. We've got pretty much every every sector, from data center to mobility to well, to all over. Uh, I'm going to let each of them quickly uh, introduce themselves here. Uh, let's go. Uh, first, we have uh, Eric Dahl, uh, VP of Business Development at uh, Strategic Venue Partners. Eric, could you tell us tell us Thank a bit you about so yourself? much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the, today's panel. I've been with SVP since about February 2020, focused in on healthcare, education, and the hospitality networks. And I've been in this industry for you know 30 plus years with telecom marketing experiences, both in the healthcare sector as well as in the uh, 3PO market. And SVP really is offers wireless infrastructure as a service as the fourth utility. We equip, we, we equip to design, deploy, manage 5G, DAS, Wi-Fi, fiber, public safety systems, IPTV, and CBRS on those private LTE networks. We manage the entire de development process. We bring a complete long-term technological solution, including multiple system upgrades. We fund it 
and we have a managed services solution that converts what traditionally has been a high price capital expenditure under, with uncertain future costs and personal allocation into a stable, high visible operating expense, freeing up those valuable assets. And look forward to the conversation today regarding the educational networks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Greg, Greg Franzen, uh, the Regional Vice President for at, uh, at Bonage. Uh, tell us about yourself. Excellent. Well, again, thanks for the introduction, Greg Franzen. Uh, at Vonage, you know, we pioneered the, the VoIP world probably 20 years ago and continue to do so um, in the enterprise space from 2013 to now, um, owning and operating our own uh, platform with unified communications, uh, contact center, as well as an API group. Um, happy to, to respond again, pioneering in the cloud. Uh, this was this COVID-19 situation was, was something that we, we see that we reacted to very quickly and hopefully get a chance to talk about that. Thanks. Uh, Nelson Ortiz, the Executive Director of Sales Engineering at Comcast Business. Tell us a bit about yourself. Thanks, Rob. Hey, thank you for having me on and truly appreciate the time. So I oversee sales engineering for Comcast Business, where our you know, three pillars, such SMB, mid-market and enterprise, been with Comcast Business for 20 years and you know, our focus has always been providing connectivity um, to businesses, but that also incorporates in educational institutions as well. You know, truly looking forward to having this discussion with my, my fellow panelists. Thanks. Uh, Jason Carolyn, CIO at Flex Flexential. Tell us a bit about yourself. Yes, thank, thanks, Rob. Appreciate uh, uh, JSA for putting these events on. I think they've been been fabulous. So appreciate the uh, the time there, Rob. Great to meet you as well. Uh, Jason Carlin, Chief Innovation Officer with Flexential. Uh, we are a na national data center, cloud services, and IT services provider. Uh, the combination of BioWest and Peak Ten over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, I've been with Flexential for 10 years and, and background in, in IT of about 25 with uh, various companies like Sun Microsystems, VMware, and uh, the Mayo Clinic. I'm really happy to be here today. We've got some, some customers that are in the education space, whether they're content providers or research institutions that have been you know, really operating um, at a high level you know, through this, whether it's you know, trying to solve you know, some of the problems that we've, we've uh, endured over the course of the last 45 to, to 90 days, but excited to talk to you all today. Thanks. And uh, Max Silber, VP of uh, Mobility and uh, Internet of Things. Uh, Matt Tell, tell us about yourself. Sure. Hi, Rob, and, and hi, everyone. Max Silber. Uh, at Matt Tell, what, what I oversee uh, specifically is mobile services. We deploy uh, fully programmed and kitted devices uh, out to the field today to around 8,000 uh, corporations, organizations, school districts, uh, ranging in size from small all the way up to major uh, enterprise size companies uh, and the federal government. Uh, the, the concept of course being access across all four major carriers in the US and devices that are really turnkey and ready to use for uh, both primary and uh, higher education. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. And I'm just going to jump right into some questions here so we can, you know, get right to the meat of the subject. In, in what concrete ways have, have each of you been seeing the, the COVID-19 pandemic affect education networks? What, what, what are we actually seeing on the ground? Let's start with Eric. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things out there, if you look at just the raw numbers, there's close to 80% of the world's enrolled doing, you know, not attending class or, or, um, or going into a remote online learning situation. And, you know, there, there's really uh, everyone in the education system is looking for a solution or a path to that. And I think from an infrastructure development company such as us and what we supply, we're looking for reliable up-to-date network infrastructure to support those technologies and delivery patterns and proven with proven security and privacy is absolute paramount. And you know, we provide that 20-year turnkey solution that really uh, lets them run their education system and lets us worry about the technology and upgrades. And what we've seen in talking to our customers out there, they're looking for a path, they're looking for a plan, they're looking for a, a strategic way of how to move toward this. And I think the, one of the most interesting quotes I saw was the director of technology at Brown University. She said, our new normal basically is recognize that we have no idea what's gonna happen in the next three to six months. And that's that's the only thing they know and we don't know, but we expect the remote instruction is gonna be needed and what kind of short-term to immediate term. 
this is time to develop that technology and that instructional design support communication roadmap and contingency plans. And we're part of that every step of the way with our customers. Interesting. Greg, what have you guys been seeing? Talk about immediate impact. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, for the last 10 years, we've probably been racing to the cloud with people saying cloud PBX, um, putting all sorts of different systems in terms of applications into the cloud. Uh, this just sped it up by about, you know, tenfold. And folks that were, were trying to make a decision on whether or not to, to move to something in the cloud were forced to do so. And the ability to do so has been, you know, the reaction of us, Vonage, as well as other panelists and other cloud communication providers, that I think that we, react, we reacted pretty quickly. Um, so, I mean, there, there's an uptick of utilization from the internet because of the cloud apps uh, in, in terms of LTE utilization that some of my panel, fellow panelists can, can provide services for, as well as the networks being congested by folks like Comcast. So with that, I'll kick it over back over to you. Speaking of Comcast, Nelson, what have you guys been seeing? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's been obviously the growth in upstreaming and downstreaming, right? We've seen a 33% growth in the network infrastructure in the core. Um, you know, VPN has grown 40%. And we've seen obviously video conferencing, which grew to almost about 200%, right? So if you take a look at, you know, the shift of traffic when we have, you know, not students, we have faculty, we have administration, we have all of these members now moving out to the home, obviously there's, it's a good thing for students because there's innovation, but also it's been, hey, the core infrastructure and everything at the home has also been impacted as well. Interesting. Jason, what are you seeing? Thanks. We're a, we're a service provider. So uh, like, like Nelson, um, you know, we have Comcast as one of our carriers and customers as well saw the 25 to 30 percent uh, increase in, in network traffic you know we've we've been working with a lot of uh, local school districts and and regional uh, and, and national research institutions for for years of trying to get them you know more connectivity into the schools and it's and it's you know this event sort of shifted that that concern to this highly distributed model of the school doesn't even matter anymore it's really about the online presence and i think that's been you know pretty radical i think microsoft uh CEO Satya Nadella uh, made a, a great comment that 10 years ago this just this shift couldn't have happened because we just didn't have the infrastructure in the ground and the technology to go to support it. So I think that's you know that's pretty phenomenal. Um, you know we've we've also seen you know unfortunately I think you know the security side of this become an issue as well. Uh, you know several customers impacted by you know ransomware events um, as everybody's gotten a little bit more distracted working from home, we've taken all of our data with you, with us, we've taken our technology with us. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think there's, there's been, um, you know, a lot of issues just on the security side. So making sure we're, we're still really staying, you know, diligent around that uh, as we go forward. Interesting. Uh, Max, what are you guys seeing at Metal? Yeah, so for, I mean, for us, the immediate uh, reaction, obviously, and it continues today is uh, really just the ability to provide access and devices to students. Um, you know, we, we, you know, and I, I mentioned this earlier as we were chatting. Most, most of us take it for granted that we have broadband at home and we've got smart devices that are up and running. But you know, a, a primary school responsibility or, or legal obligation is to provide education to everyone. And in most major cities, uh, we note that most of the students are either at or below the poverty line. So we can't make any assumptions around their ability to actually access remote education. Uh, we've been inundated with requirements to deliver either fully staged and kitted LTE capable devices for students so that they can continue their uh, their learning at home um, or for school districts that have or had made investments in either iPads or Chromebooks, um, augmenting that with a MiFi LTE connection that's locked and secured to be able to provide, again, a complete bundled solution for students to be able to start learning again. And, that, that's been the immediate, that's been the short term, the secondary education or, high, or, or, or higher education, we're, we're already in conversations around how that business model is going to shift long term and long term right now in the COVID world is two to three months. We're not talking about years from now. Um, and that's more about how to make the entire process, including that edge device 
that smart device with access to your classroom available to students entering higher education or wanting to continue that uh, that journey through higher education. Interesting. So, so to, to all of you, um, in what ways have we succeeded in meeting the demands of this this environment? And you know, what what's enabled that success? What have we done right so far, Eric? You know, I think uh, for us at SVP, you know, the customers that have planned for the, you know, present day, but also look towards the future and managing those issues, they've done well. I think the ones that have not had that plan in place, whether it be from a cloud perspective and, and, and a remote learning perspective, have really, you know, kind of had been put into, sc into scramble mode. We do know that, you know, with 5G coming down the pike, will pave the way for a faster secure future when it comes to wireless carriers LTE signal uh, on the campus and in the venue or campus environment. We also are seeing, you know, private LTE, the CBRS on go network, and also Wi-Fi 6 entering into the into the mix as well. So there's multiple infrastructure plays that can play off the same fiber, you know, same backbone structure. And the ones that have planned for that and are you know, actually working and and executing that plan are probably the ones that are in the best spot. But like I said, I think a lot of our customers are just in scramble mode right now. The good news is that you know some of them are succeeding and some of them need, need a little more help and we're there to do that. Greg, what, what have we been doing well at? Oh, we, so Von, we've reacted very well. And, and in fact, I mean, if I look at the way Vonage has been architected, we're almost purpose built for, for this remote work environment and this work from home, um, you know, our contact center, we've, we've had the ability to move people from an inside sales perspective out to the field. And obviously, again, I'm gonna push back on my guy, my, my friends from, from Mettel and Comcast from, from a connectivity perspective. They need, the, the end users need that connectivity in order to be successful. Um, but our contact center, because it's application-based and just a piece of software that sits in the, in the cloud, gives those people the ability to work from home, as well as our unified communications, which is, includes meetings and SMS, gives all the end users, again, the, the ability to collaborate on that stuff. And then thirdly, one thing that we did that was excellent is that in four or five days, we were able to stand up a free video conferencing tool for an, anybody that needed it. And that was via our API platform, which is just allowing a video conversation to be embedded into a piece of software. Yeah, I think I, think I can expand on, on, on what Greg just noted. We've really, if I had to summarize it, we planted the seed uh, using technology for the art of the possible uh, into a, a industry that quite frankly has been unchanged for about 40 years in how they deliver services and how education services are being delivered for 40 years. We'd, we'd send students into classrooms and they would get educated. Uh, we've shown in, in a very, very short period of time, in some cases with districts we've worked with, and I know most of my colleagues have, in a matter of days or weeks, we've been able to replicate uh, that experience using technology, making it more remote. I think that's step one. I think what we haven't necessarily uh, done well is, and, and that's what we're working on now, is really help those, uh, those folks in education lay out a long-term plan. Uh, it's easy to say, I could give you a tablet and you're, you're good to go, you're gonna remote learn, but there, there are elements to classroom learning that you are taking away by going digital, but there are also tools available, you know, things we use today in security, things we use today in transportation, you know, looking at rapid eye movement, looking at things where you can kind of figure out, hey, is the student engaged? Is the student unprepared? Like we, we can actually start to go down that journey and help school school districts and educators through that journey to, to actually provide overall a much better experience. And I think that's really what's gonna define how well we do long-term is how much are we willing to invest and hold the hand of uh, the education sector through that journey, not just say, hey, you know, wel welcome to the, you know, wel welcome to the new century, here's a bunch of tech, you know, good luck at it. And, and that's yeah. not always the, you know, the, the, the most positive way to, to, to collaborate with, with a partner. Mm. Nelson, what do you think we're doing yeah. well? No, absolutely. I think just to key off of what Max just said, it's really, you know, the public and private sector really coming together and understanding that importance and innovating, right? So in the past, I would imagine, you know, companies would come together like Microsoft and, and, and big software companies and say, 
you know, this is the education package. It's the same. I think now there's more innovation. There's different ways of doing things. Obviously, we were forced in that situation, but I think now the 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 public sector is now looking and, and working with the private sector to make things a little bit easier in innovating and getting these digital platforms out there in a more better way. And, and obviously there's the training factor and then obviously how do we keep it all secure? I think everyone now, especially in the education uh, networks are now looking these IT administrators on that difference maker and how do we make you know all of these applications available to children? Obviously Comcast has a big part of it and we've done everything you know, to make sure that that capacity is there, especially as the students are now working from home, whether it be K through 12 or, you know, higher education. Yeah. Jason, what else are we doing well? You know, I would agree with the, the rate of change uh, acceleration. I think that's been, been phenomenal, um, you know, to see. I, I think we also tested out you know, what is this, you know, we talk a lot in the industry about edge computing and, and thinking about, you know, distributed networks and, and you know, how, how important the network is, you know, to service delivery. And, um, you know, again, just it wasn't possible to do this in years, years gone, gone by. But, you know, I think it's Sun that said the network is the computer. You think about the last mile, uh, you know, expansions we've done, you think about the new fiber expansions that have gone online to support 5G. You know, I think hundreds, hundreds of thousands of route miles, you know, installed in, in the U.S. over the course of the last couple of years to support 5G rollout. You think about the CDNs and how they've started to disperse their, you know, their caching, you know, in, in tier two, tier three cities. I mean, all these things work together to provide, you know, the network services that we've proven, you know, can scale, right? To, for, for a company like Zoom to go from 5 million sessions to 200 million sessions um, in a drop of the hat, you know, supported by public cloud and cloud computing, absolutely. Yeah, I hate to see the bill probably at the end of the day that they're going to get from Amazon, but I think it, it's, you know, it's a testament that network technology is here to stay. The way we deliver services, you know, are going to change as, as we go down the road. For myself, I've been kind of amazed at how, how much they did do quickly, how, how many students did manage to have, you know, actually have at least part of the, the experience they expected for, 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 for whatever, you know, kindergarten all the way up through, through there, that, that we actually succeeded in doing that instead of just canceling the school year, which is what would have happened a couple of years before. But to, to each of you, what, what do you think we didn't do well? What, what didn't work? And, you know, what, what do we have to, to, to improve on here? What weaknesses were exposed? Eric? Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, from an infrastructure company, we see the, you know, relying on old and underserved outdated network infrastructure and limited bandwidth is working. The cloud computing certainly helping, but we need reliable, up-to-date network infrastructure to ensure educational ventures and campuses, you know, are available, capable, reliable, and secure. And, you know, educators are always looking for ways to maximize learning time and technology enables teachers to make better connections, explore complicated subjects. You know, and then if you get into the, nit the nitty gritty of it, you know, buffering videos, choppy applications can diminish that precious time that's available, limiting the educa educators, you know, to what they actually have to teach. And we see that 5G, private LTE, Wi-Fi 6, uh, you know, will all eliminate that headache and hassle in the future. Greg, what, 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 what weaknesses have we <clears throat> seen in our infrastructure? I, I I think the gap that needed to be filled is, was one Max touched on it was ability. So the ability to actually connect from home um, and, and use those services and those applications that we provided. Uh, next would be enablement. So training on how to use them. Uh, I think that it, as each of us have done a few of these, we've been on different applications. Um, if it's Vonage, if it's Zoom, if it's uh, WebEx or, or LogMeIn, the, the, the training and enablement that probably came after the after everything kind of went down probably wasn't sufficient i think that's what we're probably going to put most of our uh resources into over the next few few months before we go back yeah actually my my student my daughters tell me a story that they they're the three of their professors have logged themselves off during class by accident <laughs> so uh nelson what are we doing yeah. what, go ahead yeah, I, I would say from 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 a carrier perspective, you know, that shift in traffic again, no one, whether you're a carrier or, you know, at the end, an IT administrator, you know, could ever really wrap your head around that scale of everyone 
moving off of traditional, you know, network and now remote, right? So, you know, here at Comcast, we've, you know, had bits and pieces, whether it been, you know, the, the, the fires in California, where we had to rush and do some things, whether it be, you know, hurricanes in Florida. So we've had small instances of where we had to, you know, rapidly shift and add capacity. But when you're talking about a nationwide pandemic, and you have to do that on your entire infrastructure, you know, we, you know, Comcast has done a great job to mobilize and make sure that we have the capacity there. But I also agree with Greg, there's that education factor to make sure that the, the teachers and everyone, you know, everyone involved, they understand how to use Microsoft Teams or how to use Zoom or, you know, how the students interact and what's the right way of interacting. So, you know, from a carrier side, obviously, you know, capacity and infrastructure, making sure it's available, making sure that the peering relationships are available with Microsoft and with, you know, all of these teleconferencing, making sure you're bolstering that, but also making sure that, you know, the end user is really, you know, educated. And also, I guess, from an IT administrator, your digital strategy has gone from maybe 12, 16 months to two months, right? So your digital strategy, whatever you were thinking, you have to implement that now and, and go from there. Jason, what do we need to work on as an industry? Yeah, I, I mean, I think my thoughts there would, would be around just the quality of, of um, you know, the quality of the education, right? I think, I think we, we all moved really quickly to support online learning and, 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 you know, I think got some, let's call it MVP out the door. Right. But I, I don't, you know, I don't know, just, I've got two young kids, you know, myself, so I'm, I'm, you know, watching what they do and just how difficult, you know, a, a learning management system or lack of learning management system or, or, you know, lack of good quality content or, you know, even using technology to help measure, the quality of of that user experience. I think it's. I think that's. And I think which I think ultimately translates into the things that you guys are talking about about you know the quality of the education. So I think that's an area that whether we're using AI, whether we're using IoT and smart devices, whether we're measuring um, you know engagement from from eyes or, or other devices or whatever, it needs to be a comprehensive um, you know I think measurement, especially as we see this more distributed as we go forward. Max, what do we need to work on? Yeah, I think uh, outside of what I said earlier, uh, to echo what, what the other panelists said, the education piece is actually really important. Some of the best educators we have, and I know this as a, as a father of three, all going through Google Meets and Zoom meetings all day with their teachers, some of those best educators are, are typically not the most tech savvy ones. The ones that have been doing it for a while, uh, typically older generation. Uh, it, this has been a tremendous learning curve for them. Uh, we, we care for that in other verticals. This isn't our, you know, our first go around in healthcare, we design devices that literally just have to be turned on where no one needs to install anything or update anything. We have to create that requirement. We have to create essentially a user profile that tells us this user or this experience needs to be as seamless as possible so that even with education, we wanna lessen the burden on, on the actual uh, educators. So that's the first thing we have to do. The second thing is we have to have uh, we have to have some kind of DR planning here. And I'll give you the best example I have is we service um, one of our federal customers is actually FEMA. And FEMA is in the business of preparing for emergency. Part of our FEMA requirement is we actually keep twenty five thousand smart devices in our warehouse just in case, just in case. Nelson in his in one of his districts has a major hurricane and they have to care for that and they have to get devices out and field personnel, emergency personnel out. One of the biggest challenges we had as a provider of those end devices, those edge devices to students is the market just completely went dry. No one had prepared for stocking on devices in case overnight they had to give a device to every student that couldn't have access to one or afford one in order to continue the education. So th there has to be some preparedness planning uh, in case this is, an, and, and I don't think it will be a short-term bandage that we're trying to, trying to plan for, because that has to go back to the manufacturers and they have to be able to run production lines around those requirements as well. True. Uh, to all of you, how much of the changes have, that we've seen might become a permanent fixture of the landscape and you know what might be rolled back 
you know, what, what is it that's permanent here, Eric? I think in everything I've read and attended from a virtual webinar or higher education summit, you know, that they, in order for them to navigate this higher education's new normal, you know, that all those conversations come back to, you know, the crisis that they're, every college university at least that I'm focused on and dealing with is, is the emergency move from face to face to online learning. And how do they do that? There's really a five step process, you know, determining your remote strategy, facilitating the remote enablement, inspect and improve, plan for the new normal, if you even know what that is, and then enable online learning. But at the same point, try to facilitate because colleges are gonna depend and higher education for that on-campus experience as well. I know it's gonna change. I don't think it's gonna happen overnight, but they better be prepared for that change where you know the online piece is gonna take a big chunk out of their finances. Okay. So work so changes so yeah, sorry so work from home is here to stay um, the financial piece and depending on how how people operate in the current environment is going to determine whether or not they they actually everybody goes back to their office space so office space I think will be scaled back in, in this time Nelson what do you think is permanent what's yeah what's I, I, I yeah, I agree with Eric and Greg. I, I think, you know, remote learning is here to stay. I think, you know, K through 12, you're going to see, you know, snow days may be a thing of the past, right? Where now they're going to really lean on, you know, hey, kids will stay home. We, we figured this out. We don't have to worry about snow days anymore. I mean, that I think that's something that we really have to look at. And, you know, from a carrier perspective, you know, again, it's all about, you know, making sure that what we learn today from an infrastructure perspective, capacity and things of that nature that we keep, you know, again, staying on top of whatever our growth weight is, growth rate is over, you know, the next, you know, whether it's six months, maybe it's 12 months, 18 months, 24 months out, you know, how does that look? And then obviously making sure that from last mile connectivity, you know, we really want to make sure that, you know, educational institutions understand, hey, listen, you know, we have broadband, we have fiber, we have different ways, you know, whether it be LTE, you know, again, all of the access mediums out there, let's make sure that they totally understand what's available to them. Jason? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a mixture of these modes, you know, going forward. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, the snow day comment uh, is a good one, Nelson. Um, but I think, you know, campuses are important. I think the social interactions are important. You think about, you know, what, what a college, you know, as an example, really provides. And, and it's as much of a learning experience, you know, good and bad as it is, as it is anything else. And I think that's, I think that's an important um, quality um, that can't really be recreated in, in a different environment. So I hope we can sustain that. I, I do worry a little bit, you know, we've been involved in a bunch of campus, you know, safety initiatives. Um, you know, just because of, of you know, unfortunately, the, the you know, school shootings and, and things like that continue, you know, this, this takes the eye off that ball a little bit. And I, and I hope that, you know, we can continue as, as, a, as a system to help support both safe campus environments as well as, as online education. Max? Yeah, I, I, I don't think this is temporary. I think this is here to stay. I think it's the new reality. And I think that schools are going to start to think if they haven't started already of how to convert classrooms into studios so that they can really deliver high quality content as, as a way to educate uh, the users that are going to be primarily virtual. I don't think it's financially feasible to expand real estate to the point where you can have uh, safe distances between students and classrooms that are already overcrowded. And even if you did accomplish that, you'd have to double or triple the amount of educators that need to be hired in order to be able to provide that uh, that amount of education. So I think what we know is the school week is going to change. I think what we might know is the work week is going to change as well, as most of us have kind of realized the benefits and the advantages of being able to work from home and eliminate commuting from our day-to-day -day lives. And like I said, I think it's it's going to become uh, certainly within higher education, but probably primary education as well, it will become a race of content. Uh, you, you will almost get, 
you know, like you do on YouTube, you'll get rated and see how many followers you can get as an educator, as opposed to just, you know, kind of going about your business and educating your, you know, 20 to 25 kids per classroom in primary, and then a couple of hundred in, um, in higher education. Now, the, the higher education should be in the hundreds of thousands for the school to really make a decent margin based on their new business model. And in primary education, other students can opt in to professors or to educators that they can relate to, 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 to get the best experience and get that education across. Well, all indications are that we're going to have to be planning for, you know, the ongoing effects for this, at least for the, when the school year starts in the fall, which is, means we got to start figuring out, you know, the initial implementation was a bit of a scramble, but now we can plan a little bit. What should we be doing to shore up the educational networks and, and infrastructure uh, to meet the challenges going ahead from here? Um, Eric? Yeah, and, you know, I think to sum it all up is if you if you're waiting to see what happens, you're too late. Uh, you don't don't wait. Plan for both the in-person and remote learning. We see it's going to shift, and at least make sure your current and future infrastructure plan include technology that are poised to handle both and all potential uh, scenarios that you're facing in these uncertain times. And SVP can help you plan and design for that current, long-term, future-proofing your network capabilities and infrastructure. So we look forward to working with anybody that's uh, viewing the webcast today. Greg, how about you guys at Vonage? Uh, well, at Vonage and in general, I think that the, that the, the education community should invest in, in, in collaboration, bandwidth, and compute. All the guys that are on here is, are a reason that you guys at JSA put this together. They're, and what, what's going to need going to need to happen is those folks that invest in those things will then need to be trained. Like I said earlier, um, knowing how to use your devices and the effectiveness that you might have with your students, as well as how much they'll learn from you. Again, if if you're a good teacher and you're a good teacher on video. Uh, in person, will you be that way on video? And how do you measure? How is a, how is a, a university or a K through 12 institution going to measure that and give parents and people that are paying for an education the idea that they're doing a good job and it's worth the money? So I think investing and doing some sort of training around how well you how well you can get your message across is going to happen or needs to happen. Hmm. Nelson, how about you guys at Comcast? What do you think we need to be doing? Yeah, I think, you know, for sure, you know, district-wide networks, you know, not just in the education, but district-wide, right? So, you know, you have City Hall, you're going to have, you know, the different schools within that district really look at their digital and infrastructure strategy. And, and, and to Jason's point earlier, you know, really look at your security policy practices, look at your disaster recovery practices. And, and really make sure that you're rethinking and reprioritizing across the board, starting with obviously, you know, what Comcast business has to offer, right? So we, if, you know, again, last mile connectivity. And, and as you go up the stack, you know, looking at your, you know, your firewalls, your VPN infrastructure, your security infrastructure, taking it to the next level, your cloud, you know, how you're routing your traffic, how packets, you know, really take step by step and rewrite your policy, um, whether it be security or disaster recovery, and make sure that all inclusive, you have everything covered to the best of your ability. And, and again, get ready for the ne that next shift if that were to ever happen, where again, you're going to have a lot of remote users working from home. Jason? Yeah, I think just some recent data I saw. Uh, you know, the the data growth rate continued you know during this period at its accelerated pace and I think you know how important education and research and, and and you know healthcare systems are um you know just making use of that data using it to to make smarter decisions and and you know add add to that better quality outcomes I think ultimately to the end users you know just making sure we're all spending time and have you know good programs to support that you know at a national or, or regional level. Max. Yeah, I've, I've supported, and certainly through this, uh, many different school districts. Uh, they all seem to have different policies or different standards to kind of echo what Nelson said and Greg said earlier. Uh, you, you have to kind of get on the same page. The more an industry like education gets on the same page, the easier it is for us to deliver a much better solution across the board. Ultimately, technologists just 
you know, kind of take what what the order is off the menu and and try to create some solutions around that. So so generating those policies and those standards and and those actually when I start talking about like software you can implement to see how engaged students are, not not just to have that one-on-one -on -one call. That should really be part of it because part of the problem isn't just delivering the education or how you plan to deliver the education, but it's also how do you make the receiver of the education, the student, be in an environment where they can learn. And I see this as a father of three when one of my kids is on you know, a Google Meet and they're paying attention and I'm pretty strict. I want to get their education in. But then I see other kids on the on the meeting and they're running around and they're going to get a snack and sitting back down. I always say, how do you emulate that complete experience where the student is essentially at school, even if they're sitting in their bedroom or they're sitting in the kitchen? How do you create some policies and some uh, requirements around their their you know their need to also be part of that learning process. Great. Well, this has been this has been very very interesting. So thank you all of you for joining us for this uh, for this JSA roundtable. And uh, I think uh, we're going to be uh, pulling in uh, in uh, Carl here. Carl, want to take over? Yes, please. Thank you, everyone, for your insights on COVID 19s impact on education networks. Um, once again, our all star panelists, Eric Dahl, Strategic Venue Partners, Greg Franzen, Vonage, Nelson Ortiz, Comcast Business, Jason Carolyn, Flexential, Max Silver, Mattel. And a big thank you to our guest moderator, Rob Powell, founder and chief editor of Telecom Ramblings, for keeping us on point today. Just a quick reminder. Our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour uh, to answer any more of your questions over on LinkedIn. Just search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or click the direct link in the chat box to continue the Q&A. And viewers, if you are one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our current series, on exploring the impact of COVID-19 on our industry and client verticals. Next one up, June 18th, as we talk through how we'll be redefining communications in the wake of COVID-19. Well, that's a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy networking and stay safe. Thank you.